so the last thing I remember is thinking, okay, I guess this is where I'm going to die. Because I couldn't breathe. And I couldn't tell anyone I couldn't breathe. And my anesthesiologist looked totally freaked out. I was actually kind of good with the dying thing. Strange as that sounds, I was, I was okay with it because I'd been in labor for two days. And to be transparent, I was not doing well. Uh, the baby wasn't moving and all of the pain management we tried didn't work. So epidurals, top offs, experimental stuff, no dice. And I was done. And it sounds like I'm just being dramatic when I say that, but legitimately my body was done because my kidneys started shutting down. And when the medical staff realized that, they kind of rushed me off for an emergency C-section. Because we'd had all that pain management before, I should have been numb from my waist down, but I was numb from my eyeballs down. Which is why I couldn't breathe, why I couldn't talk, and probably why the anesthesiologist looked freaked out. Um, obviously, the surgery went okay, I'm here. <laughs> my kid's fine too. Uh, the next part that I remember is my nurse. She came up and grabbed my hand afterward and she goes, yo, that was intense. <laughs> you were amazing. Don't ever do that again. Um, if you want to have another kid, that's fine. Just schedule the C-section when you find out you're pregnant. She's absolutely right. I will never do that again. That was a terrible time. Because that day I hit a physical limit in my body. The point at which it said absolutely no more, we're done here and will not be taking questions. And normally when you think about hitting a limit, you think you're just going like, to walk up to it and touch it and say, oh, okay, there's the limit. I'll stop here. That's not what happens. No. When you hit a limit, it's like there's a sliding glass door and you don't know it's closed. So you go to take a step and then bam, in your face. There's the limit. It is painful. It is embarrassing. And we don't want to do it again. So to prevent that kind of experience, we set up boundaries for ourselves. And boundaries become the new limits. Sometimes we call these limiting beliefs because they're not hard limits. They're just where we believe the limit is. And limiting beliefs aren't bad, necessarily. The problem is limits themselves because limits are contextual, meaning if something changes, you, the circumstances, your environment, if something changes, the limit can change. And if the limit expands and you don't, you're now missing out on possibility which also isn't really a problem until it's a problem. If it's working for you, why do something different? But eventually, if change happens often enough, something has to give and you have to move. And six years ago, I had a lot of problems. I was tens of thousands of dollars in debt. I was clinically depressed and clinically obese, because you know, if we're gonna check the boxes, let's check them all. Um, I was working at this job that was just sucking the soul right out of my body, and my boss hated me, which is absolutely remarkable because I am a constant delight. So I don't know what her problem was. And it felt like the entire universe was conspiring against me. Like everything that I did to try to make it better didn't work. And it was everyone else's fault, which is a little reassuring when it's not your fault is not helpful. Because when it's someone else's fault, you think they're going to come fix it. And no one was coming. Now, I wasn't totally done here. I had a, an opportunity. I had some doubt. That's the, actually the only thing I had. Because I knew it couldn't possibly be this awful forever. Like, it had to, there, were, there had to be a way for it to be better. And when we talk about doubt, normally we talk about it in really negative contexts. Like, doubt is this terrible thing that we should never do. No, doubt is necessary. Doubt is the first step to change. Everything hinges on doubt. If you think about any meaningful contribution to society, it all started with doubt because someone said, this is the limit. This is the best we can do. And someone else said, nah, I don't think so. I think we can do better. And then they tried. And if they get it right, we go, oh my god, they're a visionary. Yeah, kind of. They were a doubter. They had an idea. But they had no idea that it would actually work. Because we don't get to know in advance whether or not our ideas are any good. You don't get to know until you know. 
And that's the power of doubt. It's uncertainty. Because if you have certainty, it's done. It is what it is, and there isn't any arguing with it. But if you have uncertainty, there's a chance. And a chance is, is nice, but it's not usually enough to make us move. But here's what happened to make me move. Two events happened back to back. First, I had a performance review with my boss, and she told me in no uncertain terms that I would never make $50,000 ever. I wasn't worth it. I didn't deserve it. It wasn't going to happen. Don't even ask. That was annoying. And then I went on a really bad second date. So this guy, because I told him where I worked on the first date, Googled my salary before our second date and came and informed me that he made twice as much money as me and he didn't have a college degree. I now had a mission. I was going to make more money than that douchebag and give my boss the proverbial middle finger at the same time. <laughs> yeah. And so I started trying stuff. I applied to all sorts of jobs that I probably wasn't qualified for, but I needed to make more money because now I was mad. And I actually got one of those jobs. I got a job offer for $67,000 to do strategy for a big company. I'd never done strategy before in my life. I had no idea if I could actually do it. But 67 is more than 50, and I said, yes, thank you, I will take that. And it turns out I'm actually really good at strategy. Mm. It, it was kind of fun. And that went really well, which then gave me the idea for how to change other things in my life that weren't going well. So it all starts with doubt. But then it moves to curiosity. Doubt says, can I do it? Curiosity says, how can I do it? And then you go look for some answers. And you evaluate them. You do like a risk-reward analysis. And a lot of times we get stuck here because the risk looks scary. But we also have to think about the reward. Um, I heard Tony Robbins say it this way. He said, people will do more to avoid pain than they will ever do to experience pleasure. So don't be those people. <laughs> be better than those people. If the reward is greater than the risk, and there's a decent chance it's not going to make everything come crashing down, you have to do the next step, which is suspend your disbelief long enough to get a result. Might not always be the result that you want, but it's just a result. A result is data, and data isn't personal. Might hurt your feelings, still isn't personal. And you use the data to define what you're going to do next. So this is what I kept doing. I kept trying stuff, and sometimes I failed, like big time. And I love it when people say, you could be anything you want to be. Yeah, sure, you can. You just might not be good at it. You can do anything you want to do. You only get to control your actions. You never get to control the outcome. OK, so let, let's say for a second that I wanted to be a professional basketball player. For context, I'm as good at basketball as you think I am. OK? It does not matter how hard I work at it. It doesn't matter how long I try. I'm never going to make it to the NBA or the WNBA, OK? That's, that's not in the cards for me. So the things that we can be successful at are the things we can be successful at. But it's not everything. And it pains me to say this, because I love being good at everything. But I'm just not. No one is. We all have different skill sets. We all have different aptitudes. And so I leaned into the things when I tried it and it worked. And I did fewer of the things when I tried it and it failed. And here's what happened. Oh, just for reference, that sounds pretty scientific. It wasn't. It was Jenga, OK? It wasn't science. It was Jenga, because I looked at things, and I'm like, oh, I wonder if I could do that. Let's touch it, touch it. That seems OK. And then I tried, right? So 18 months later, here's what happened. I paid off all the debt. That was a good day. I got out of the obese category into one I was more comfortable with, also a good day. Got my depression under control. That was a good day. I uh, learned how to have healthy relationships. And I was doing work that I liked, and I was doing really good at it. So I got promoted twice, and I tripled the income that I was making at the bad job in 18 months. Now, it sounds super sexy when I link them all together like that. They are just symptoms of a little bit of courage, because it takes courage to doubt. It takes courage to be curious. It takes courage to suspend your disbelief, and it takes courage to deal with the results. 
And when I learned actually from this whole experience wasn't those accomplishments. Now, they, they were good days. I'm not going to lie. They felt really good when they happened. But those were really good moments of joy. The bigger thing was I felt fulfilled because I learned how to grow and I learned how to make my world bigger. And growth is what actually makes us feel happy, which is super annoying because growth sucks. It is highly uncomfortable, but it's necessary. Growth is what expanded my limits, and doubt is what allowed me to test them. So here's the thought. What if your limits weren't permanent? What if they could move? What if things could be better? Now, it's going to take some work, so go do something. But when you're doing something, do it based on tomorrow's possibilities, not today's limits. Thank you.